Hey everyone, we're live. Hey, it's hap I'm happy to see all of you. It is Boozy Book Club. I can't believe that we're actually here right now. If you're joining us via podcast, this is the Totally Normal Podcast. And this episode, uh, we have not had Boozy Book Club in like months. I can't even, I'm not sure when the last one was. I think it might have, well, we, we considered our In the Water Weeds Voyager Hangouts Boozy Book Club because it was about a book. But really, they were like Outlander slash Hangoutlanders. And so it was like half Boozy Book Club, half Hangoutlander. But this is legitimately Boozy Book Club. That's the only time I'm going to even say the word Outlander incorrectly. If you're some people and you think I say it incorrectly, that's the only time I'm going to say Outlander. No, that is dumb. Outlander. Anyway, tonight we are talking about two books. One is One of Us is Lying by Karen M. McManus. And the other one is Ta -da 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 -da, What Happened by Hillary Rodham Clinton. And um, today. And uh, we're very excited. I'm Beth. It is Boozy Book Club. So I am drinking because I want to talk about Hillary's book, Super Drunk Later. I'm having a beer. I'm also having Rotel, which apparently not everybody knows what that is, but it's a delicious cheese dip. Velveeta. I love that so much. That is like, like my entire five years in St. Louis is Rotel dip. Like, I'm I'm concerned that there's a regional <laughs> like segregation of Rotel in between like people you only eat it in certain. It doesn't. Everybody should have it. Everybody. Anyway, it's delicious. My husband made it for his dinner. I came home and I was like, I'm having that. <laughs> That's what he had for dinner. We are very Southern. Anyway, having a hotel. So everyone else say hello. Um, Amy, say hello. Tell us what you're drinking. Hey, I'm Amy. I'm drinking once again, the Ballast Point Grapefruit Sculpin, which is my jam. And I asked my local to stock it. And now that they do, I feel like I have to buy it all the time. So that's cool. Um, Beth, I noticed you have your Hillary button on. I'm old enough to where I pulled out my Clinton Gore button from the 1992 Clinton campaign. That was my first presidential election, so. That's wild. My yeah. dad has a a Bush quail button. <laughs> uh, bless his heart. Okay. Um, this button says Wizards with her. Ah. And I got it at New York Comic Con last year, right before the election, That's in the awesome. Javits Center. And Aww, it, sad I was really excited. Yeah, I was really excited to have it, and kind of sucks. Anyway, um, we have uh, new people on our panel, and people you haven't seen in a while, and people you may only have seen once or twice. So they're going to introduce themselves, and they're going to tell us what they write for about at That's Normal, and if they're drinking anything and um, other cool stuff. So let's start with Anne. Say hello, Anne. Hey guys, I'm Anne. Um, I haven't written in so long, but I just had a baby, so I'll use that as my excuse. And that's also why I'm drinking water, because I have to pump after this, <laughs> so. Um, but you don't want to pump and dump after Boozy yeah, Book Club? I gotta, I gotta go back to work in two weeks, so I need all I can get, so. Ah, uh, the liquid gold. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I miss pumping. <laughs> I know. <laughs> sound, sound of the pump. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Haunts your dream. Like, wondering why the pump is so loud when the baby is sleeping, and you're like, why did they make these so loud? The baby needs to be asleep. So stupid. Oh, well. We're glad to have you, and her baby is very, very special. So, yay. All right, Emily, can you say hello? Hi, I'm Emily. Um, probably the newest of the bunch. I'm not drinking anything, but I just ate a giant cheeseburger, so I feel like that kind of makes up for it. Um, I've been writing about either books or really trashy TV. So if those things are your jam, then you're in luck. <laughs> it's been very fun having Emily on the, on the team. And we're glad she came. I'm glad she read the books. Yay! <laughs> was touch and go there for a while. <laughs> I know, me too. Katie, say hi. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I am drinking, um, some fat tire. Try to pretend it's still summer. Um, I write, um, Usually Vikings, some Outlander, and then just incredibly random things intermittently for that normal. Y'all want to hear a fun Katie tidbit? Always. From me. Katie writes my favorite shit on the whole <laughs> site. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, everybody else. When Katie writes, I'm like, I'm in it. I'm literally guffawing through the whole thing. I eat it up. And the fact that she doesn't write more often makes me real sad because it's legit my favorite. The rest of you all suck. And I suck worse than anybody, but Katie's the best. I have to, I have to like, you know, hoard it up before I'm able to like spit it out. So it's like, it's like a rare diamond. Is how That's like, you're like write a anything all year. That one piece that you wrote about, um, the representation of women, um, on the crew of Outlander and the director's chair and everything that would have been worth it. I would have not, that would have been fine. If you just pinch it all up for that one piece, which was one of my favorite things that I've read all year. <laughs> yeah. Katie's like a dude whose wife really wants to get pregnant, so he's not allowed to touch himself for like, <laughs> like a good three and a half weeks, and then just that one day, so she's like, you pin it's it like, all up. Oh. <laughs> That's what your writing is like. It's like really potent, potent splooge. And, 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 and now my obituary is written, so... <laughs> <laughs> if Poets Blue ends up on anybody's <laughs> obituary, I'll consider myself the poet laureate of the United States. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. That was not to denigrate anybody else's work. Amy and everyone and everybody writes wonderful things. He just happens to be the ones who make me laugh the loudest. <laughs> um, let's get into one of us is lying. This was our YA thriller of the month, I asked our brand new Boozy Book Club group on Facebook, which if you're not a part of it, go join it. It's like facebook.com slash group slash TN Book Club. All one like thing, T capital TN Book Club. And you need to join it because in there, you get to do things like vote on the poll about what YA thriller we're going to read next. And this is the one that won. And uh, if you read it, great. Tell us online. If you're on uh, Twitter, use the hashtag TN Book Club to talk to us tonight. Um, although if you really just like say, hey, to that's normal, I'll probably see it. But I also probably won't be checking it very much because it's not on my computer for some reason. I'm having to look down on my phone and I don't like my profile when I look down. So I'm going to be looking up a lot. Anyway, this book was like, like touted as The Breakfast Club meets like 10 or one of those other like Gretchen McNeil books. Um, and it definitely was Breakfast Club S, Pretty Little Liars esque, I think is probably more accurate. And um, most of us read it. So, what did you guys think about? Um, we're going to start with the characters because the tropes about like the Breakfast Club is, are very evident in the very first part. And, um, and then you, you follow these four characters all the way through to the end. And what was your impression of them and how they fit into like regular YA? teen movie tropes. Anybody? Honestly, I don't think I'd be able to stand anybody named Bronwyn. <laughs> it's just no good for me. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird name. Every yeah. time I said it. And then she was Colombian, half Colombian. Mm -hmm. So her last name was Rojas. Yeah, it was a, an interesting combo. That It was like a Gallic, Elvish, <laughs> Warlord daughter's name, first name, and then like a Latina last name, surname. It didn't I mean, go well, but we go very well together. Props to her parents for variety, I guess, but I don't know. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't take that seriously. Had to pretend, pretend her name was something else. I think maybe that's why they did it. Like, isn't her mom Swedish? Her mom is Swedish, and her dad is Colombian. I'll so take they were like, for it. Bronwyn Rojas. <laughs> Strong name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of like Eowyn of the Rohan, but Rohan is not a Latina name. It's a made up name from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Close enough. But yeah, it was kind of obnoxious. My mm -hmm. problem was really with Bronwyn was, I mean, I had problems with kind of all of them. The four main characters are Addie and Bronwyn and Nate. And my problem with them was they all felt so similar. And Amy, you mentioned that when you were talking about the book and how you couldn't finish it. But it's very true even as you go through the rest of the novel. Um, all of them have like some secret that they're hiding, but they all are inherently good. Like 
Bronwyn is an A plus student who's cheated on a chemistry. By the way, spoilers, spoilers <laughs> for this book. Um, if you're listening, Bronwyn is like a perfect student who cheated to get a good grade on chemistry. And I'm just going to throw this out real quick because this bugged me. If you're a perfect student, like at, honestly, like an A plus student, you don't make less than a 95 and you're in high school, you are not going to fail chemistry. That's not going to happen because chemistry is math and memorization. And the only thing you have to do in school in order to make straight A's is be super good at memorization and good at math and like maybe good at writing, but chemistry doesn't require any of that. So like it's a bad subject for them to be like, she's failing it. Like maybe calculus because that math is really hard. And because that's the only subject I ever failed, but not <laughs> chemistry. It's so easy. I don't know. Doesn't that seem weird to y'all that she would be failing chemistry? It's not like it's organic chemistry in college. It's really hard. Well, her problem secret just seemed like such a, not a big deal compared to some of the other things. It was like, okay, you cheated on one test once. Like nobody cares. I don't know. It just seemed like such a, maybe for her, I guess that's the point is it's a big problem, but compared to the other secrets, I don't know. It was just not as interesting or like you said, it just didn't seem feasible. Yeah, I um, didn't, I agree with what you said, Beth, about they all seem so good and that their secrets were not horrible, see, like not a secret that you would kill somebody over. And so because of that, like the, I guess the big reveal, like I wasn't surprised by, and I was kind of suspecting that from the very beginning, like from, you know, if I had to, like after, I guess after it happened, if you had to ask me who I thought did it, my for, my initial guess would have been the person that actually, I don't know if we're trying to, you said spoilers everywhere. So I would have guessed that the guy that, you know, like when he drank the, some like his glass of water, I was like, well, that's fishy. Um, I don't know. So the whole thing, like the whole premise of like, oh, we're really focusing on these four students. I don't know. Like I just thought that was a little bit unbelievable that they wouldn't even consider that there was anything else. Like the car accident seems suspicious. Everything about it was like, this is totally a setup from the very beginning. And yeah, all the characters were like, oh, there's no way they would have done that. So yeah, I don't know. It, it just seemed like it, when you come up with a, with a character who like Addie, for instance, Addie is like the perfect girl um, who's been dating the same boy since she was 14 and, um, and, their sex life didn't start until after junior prom and she's her secret is that she slept with somebody one night, um, somebody else like got drunk and slept with somebody else. But inherently like she's not a bad character. She feels bad for what she did. She's trying to like hide it, but a bad character, like a character, like character that has a little bit more like meat to her probably would have used that, encounter with the other guy to like get her way a little bit more. She would have been more manipulative. She wouldn't just have been a doormat for a dude, you know, and just kept going on with her life in this way. And then of course she has a decent character arc. She kind of grows a little bit, but at the same time, it just felt like they were all kind of the same. All of them were hiding a little secret, but it was like a mistake or it was a, yeah. um, a secret that's not bad once it comes out and everybody forgives them for, um, Nate is a drug dealer, but, an honest one, like honorable, oh, like his mom. Yeah. Like he's super likable and his, he's this honorable drug dealer who's going out like selling pills, but his mom left him and his dad's a drunk. So he has to have money in order to keep the lights on. It's not like he's just dealing drugs because he's a thug or because he's, you know, doesn't care about people or whatever. Like he's the drug dealer with a heart of gold. And all of them are like that. Like Cooper is the all American guy on the baseball team who just, oops, is gay. And he's just holding it in because his dad is going to hate him for it. Of course, super tropey. Right. Which so, also the, the backlash for when that came out, I was like, this is so unrealistic, especially like for a book that, I mean, maybe if it was 10 years ago. Yeah. But I'm like, there's no way that, you know, you walk in the lunchroom and the entire school is going to heckle you about it. Like, not in the know. Bay Area or wherever this is, San yeah. Diego. Yeah. I'm like, that doesn't, I don't know. I just felt like that was like not really realistic. Yeah. And not in that area. I wouldn't think not in that area of the country where every kid is going to yeah. act like that. But okay. Tropes aside, <laughs> characters aside, what was your overall like thought about 
a book? Like, what would you give it? What did you think? It, would you think it was like good YA or what? Um, I, I like the unfolding of it, like kind of how she would, you know, tease like little bits of like, oh, but there's little bits of like, oh, but there's something more. So you didn't get it all at once, which I appreciated. And so even though the overall mystery of like who did it was maybe a little bit predictable, like I felt like the story at least unfolded and it kept me turning the pages to find out more of what was going to happen and, you know, who all was implicated and how it all worked together. Um, you know, that part. I felt like that unraveled well, at least. So there was more to it than you initially thought. So overall, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Um, you know, I don't know. It was just a fun YA. It wasn't didn't blow my mind, but I also, it was interesting enough to keep reading and that I enjoyed it. Yeah, I agree. It was one of those books, I think I read it in like five hours on a Sunday afternoon. You could get through it very quickly. So that's, there's something to be said for that if you just want a quick read. And I thought, I think the topic of, you know, like school scandal, I don't know how to classify it, but it's kind of sadly relevant right now. So I thought that was an interesting, something new. I don't know. I'm sure there's other books that cover that, but just the idea of that going on is maybe something that's worth reading about. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a page turner. I mean, I wouldn't say like, not like in the way that like, you know, great, you know, authors are or whatever, but I still like was interested to see what was going to happen next. I didn't really put it down for a long amount of time. That's partially because I was trying to get through it. <laughs> so I had to make sure, make sure that I read it. But um, it was definitely a page turner in, in that way. And like I wanted to keep reading it. And she did like let some information trickle out. But if she'd given us more than what she did, even in the beginning, it would have been way too obvious. I think that I had figured out the central um, who done it very early on. I felt Ooh. like I felt like it was very obvious that yeah. the four students had nothing to do with it. Um, even even simple things like the epipens being found in Nate's locker later on, and all of those kinds of things. I never once felt like any of them had it in them to be the one to do it. And the title of the book made me feel like we were getting four narrators and one of them is going to be unreliable. One of them is going to be giving us information that isn't true and isn't what they really think and feel, but it wasn't written that way. Um, there wasn't any indication that any of the narrators were really holding back um, in the way that they spoke. There wasn't any indication that they were unreliable and what they were relaying to us wasn't true. And then of course there's that very beginning thing where Simon says, I'm the omniscient narrator. And that is the one like literary thing in it that makes you say, Oh, he's the unreliable narrator. And you kind of see that immediately. If one of us is lying, it can't be these four because they're giving us real emotions and they're giving us like what, someone's eyes look like and those aren't the tropes of an unreliable narrator an unreliable narrator gives you less and less and so for him to say i'm the omniscient narrator um at the very beginning of the book lets you know that he's the one that's lying and everything is going to be revealed later on so i felt very from the very beginning oh he's doing this to himself and um, he's going to like trickle out information about them as the book goes on and make it look like they're guilty. And I just, I, it, and so it didn't have a whole lot of like suspense for me because of that. But um, I did want to know what their secrets were. And I did want to see like who was um, doing the, the postings and things like that. Um, so that part was interesting. Um, but as far as like young adult novels go, I would give it three-ish. I'd let my 13-year-old read it. Yeah, I guess <laughs> it's good. Um, it's it's good. I think that I did read a review talking about um, it being problematic um, about just uh, mental health, um, him being depressed, and this is you know kind of how he deals with it. That type mm -hmm. of mental health issues, um, some of the stuff that Cooper's going through, not being handled with any kind of like um, empathy and even just kind of like slut shaming a little bit, like handling, handling sexuality in a, in a kind of toxic way. And I can see some of that. I definitely see how like some of the mental health issues aren't really handled very well. Um, but I don't think that YA necessarily, 
is can always be the forum for doing things perfectly and doing things um, the way that everybody thinks that they need to be done. A lot of times you just need kids to read about other kids that might be doing what they're doing and come out with a positive outcome. That's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I don't know how you, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure how you would really handle it differently from a, other than just like this was, it was more like a factual, like he had these issues. I don't know what else you're supposed to do with that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it says, you know, you know anybody who's like gets upset, you know, when you mishandle sexuality or, you know, mental illness, yeah. just that maybe this isn't the book for them. So if you're, if you, yeah. you're, hurt by that kind of stuff or um you're sensitive to it then this is probably not a book that you would enjoy um if you like tropes if you like drug dealing bad boy tropes if you like um you know mean girl tropes and things like that then then you would you you really like it um there's kind of some 90s i felt like it had some 90s tropes in it sometimes it felt like a heathers um felt like Heather's sometimes and sometimes it felt like Pretty Little Liars and sometimes it felt like Jawbreaker. So, I mean, it had like a lot of like, I thought, um, harken back to some of those like cool 90s movies, but mm -hmm. it's not bad. It's a good mm -hmm. way. Okay. So we're going to give it thumbs ups or thumbs downs. This is what we do up in Boozy Book Club. If you didn't read it, you still have to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down so that we can panel it out. You're not allowed to give it a half a thumb. You have a whole thumb. Or a no thumb. So I, I'm going to give it a thumb because I'd let my 13 year old read it. Okay. Anne, what's your thumb going? I can't no, see your thumb, Anne. Okay. Anne and me and Emily, who read it, are giving it a thumbs up. <laughs> Kate and Amy are giving it a thumbs down. That's three wine bottles. This is how we do things here at Boozy Book Club. Three wine bottles for one of us is lying. Well, it's not totally true that I didn't read it. I tried to read it. And four chapters in, I decided I had much better things to do with my time. <laughs> That's true. I'm old and I only have so many years left and I will not waste them <laughs> on a bad book. I understand. It's, it's not like literary genius. It's just. It's just a YA book about yeah. four kids. who. No, I tried to. I was sitting by a pool doing dick all trying to read this book and I could not even get into it. <laughs> well, I folded laundry and cleaned this room right behind us, guys, while listening to it on audiobook. So, oh well, um, Heidi, um, shout out to Heidi. She said that that really would have maybe fixed my issue because I thought there were too many voices and characters and none of them sounded distinct. But she said when you listen to it, every character had a different voice, so maybe it was easier to keep up with listening to it on tape. But reading it, no. Maybe, yeah. I felt like they were too similar. Um, just their internal life was too similar. They can't all be the heart yeah. of gold with a with a small, simple secret. That doesn't work. So I felt like the interior, like their interior life, was too much alike and sounded too much like the author. And I did listen to it, and I didn't like Cooper's accent because he was supposed to be from Mississippi, oh. and he was not from Mississippi. <laughs> he would never have said Rotel. I'm having Rotel for dinner. <laughs> And his accent kept coming out, like he kept saying things, and then she had phonetically spelled it, and he would like get mad at himself for saying it, but that's not how phonetically you would say it if you were from Mississippi. So I was real irritated. <laughs> I don't understand why accents are so difficult for people to phonetically do. Don't just don't do it. I guess I guess I have that thing where um Anytime any author goes out of their own experience in life and tries to write about it, a person who's actually had that experience can kind of like shut it down and be like, that's not what it's like. And so they feel like they have to speak into that experience that they're reading about and be like, that's not real. I'm like that with Southern accents. So <laughs> I don't have any like anything else that I can talk about. Maybe if people were like the evangelical Christian community in the mid South and I'll be like, wait a minute. <laughs> no, I know that. And you don't that and Southern accents. Those are my wheelhouse. So get them right next time. No, I'm the same way. I hate in movies. It kills me when someone's just have a Southern accent and it's like, you sound nothing. And even being from Kentucky, it's like, there's different 
accents based on which part of the state you're from. And so it's oh, yeah. like, yeah, it's, it drives me crazy too. I'm with you. If you want so to hear a really, yeah. go ahead. I was just say, at least reading the book, you didn't have to hear someone's bad Southern accent. Yeah. But I can't yeah, imagine, same. I can't imagine it slipping, someone slipping in and out of it and that being realistic to listen to. Also, he called his dad pop, which we don't know. No. No Southern, I don't know, a single Southern person that calls Does a, either that a, do that? a father figure, even. Mm -hmm. It's not even like a grandpa name we really use down here. Mm -mm. No. Because it reminds you of Northerners who say pop for soda, and that's not okay. <laughs> it would make more sense for him to say dada than it would pop, and he's 17. Oh, God. I call my dad daddy. That's what I do. And I know that some people think that's super you weird. You don't. You still do? Yes. <laughs> I mean, not if I'm talking about him. <laughs> but if I call him, hey, daddy. I call him daddy. Daddy. Daddy, I'm eating Rotel for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't call my mom mommy, though. I don't call her anything. I've heard what you but call anyway, my mom. Let's get into the 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 big book of the of the month. The uh, yes, <laughs> book event. It is event novel novelization. I cried, but I'm not. I'm not leading this discussion. Our wonderful, bless Amy's heart, is leading this discussion. Talk. Tell us what we're talking about tonight, Amy. Um, we are talking about what happened by Hillary Rodham Clinton. Ta -da. Exactly. What the hell happened? <laughs> so, of course, my nose starts running. Just I'm about to start talking. So, you know, when this book came out, there were lots of emotions from people. Oh, I'm too scared to read it. I don't want to read it. I want to read it. Hillary should just shut up. Um, and I found myself not really having any opinion I mean, besides, I did not think that Hillary should shut up. To me, she should, she can keep talking, and you know, until the Lord gives her no more breath. But I wasn't really scared to read it. I just wasn't quite sure of what it would be like. Um, and of course, we're all still really raw from November, but then continually continuing to be raw on a daily basis because of the garbage that we see coming out of our executive branch. And um, I just wasn't sure. So I was very pleasantly surprised at how readable this book was. Like I just picked it up and I started to fly through it. And it was so much more personal, so much more legitimately angry, and so much more just I had such empathy for Hillary and she talks about at the end of the book about how she tries to hold on to her empathy. And I just felt that it was just so um, revealing in her as a person and a character that she really kind of let you in on her real feelings about things. Um, so, you know, to you guys, did you think it was kind of a really readable book? You know, what, what did you think going in? Did you have any expectations? Did the book meet your expectations? For me, I just didn't have any. And, I was just pleasantly surprised and I, I really liked the book. I think um, I was kind of um, okay. like fatigued going in. Like I was where I was just like, I was so tired of like just all of the chatter and all of the like, you know, everything around it that I just, I was, you know, it was less dreading it than just feeling like I just can't relive that. Um, but I agree, like, I think her voice is so natural and um, just really, um, you know, her, her humor is so easy. And, you know, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm roughly the same vintage as, as you. I have like a long bank of Hillary Clinton in my, in my memory banks. And, you know, I think that it has been really hard for her to, to get that, you know, being so smart and so kind of plugged in and so, having to be so cautious for really good reason. I think it's been really hard for her to, you know, inhabit that skin publicly. And it just, it was really, like I really enjoyed reading, just reading her voice kind of unfiltered and, and yes, and angry and funny and, 
you know, hurting um, and all of those. So I just, I, I just, I think it was a great read. Yeah, for me, it, it exceeded my expectations on all those levels because I haven't read a political book in a long time. I mean, probably, or, or, or a book from a political, you know, figure in a long time. And um, I just wasn't expecting it to be as transparent and honest and readable and and engrossing as it was. And my experience with Hillary has been, she's just been in the background of everything for my whole life. I don't remember like not ever knowing who she was. <laughs> So, cause she became the first lady when I was little. So I don't ever remember her like not being there and the same, same age as her daughter. And so I remember always feeling bad for her because other than having curly hair, I didn't look too different than Chelsea Clinton as, a, <laughs> as an adolescent. Um, so I had that same kind of like really awkward looking nose. And so I understood, I remember feeling very like, uh, like I had a camaraderie with her from a young age, but like I was just wasn't expecting her voice to be so um, warm and um, so much so something that I wanted to keep reading and, and just felt really, really good about. And that wasn't that I didn't expect that. So I was I I found it compulsively readable. I, I wish that I had had more. It wasn't until I got to the end where she was doing a lot of figure talking, a lot of like you know, these percentage points and this percentage point and um, Trump got this in Pennsylvania versus this and this, you know, and, I, and that's the only part that I was like, I know this is there for posterity, but I want to like hear more about your Chardonnay and like what you did like and how pissed off you are about it. I don't really want to hear about the figures. That was the only point where I was kind of like, uh, get to the, something else. So mm. other than that, I loved it. And um, for, yeah, so for me, I, I guess similar to Beth, like I was, I guess, young, like when she was first lady. And so my perception of her, I don't know, it was, I guess it was neutral. Um, and then I think I always, because I didn't know that much about her, I think I always had like this house of cards feel about her of like, oh, she just stayed with her husband because she wanted to eventually run for office. And, you know, like I, I didn't, I guess my perception of her was maybe not the most positive. So um, for me reading the book, you know, I, anything I knew about her was probably biased from the media. And so for me, reading the book actually was like a big eye opener of like, I actually really like her as a person. Like for me, my vote for her was more of a vote against Donald Trump than like, oh, because I really like Hillary Clinton. Um, I thought it was cool that, you know, oh, we could have a woman president. But from what I knew about her, I wasn't like the biggest Hillary Clinton fan. And then my husband probably got tired of me while I was reading about it reading about her like saying like oh did you know this did you know this to like going from on the neutral to cool side to like i think she's great now and i feel like we missed out on a huge opportunity to have someone that is to me seems like it seems like a very genuinely written book that you know it's like she seems like not a typical politician like she genuinely cares and is looking to do the best she can for people and those are her motivations whereas i feel like right now our political climate is full of people that are not like that and so it just made me really sad that um like i feel like as a country i'm like we really missed out on a good person being president and yeah so it took me from neutral to cool to being very pro hillary even more so than when i voted for back in november <laughs> emily yeah, uh, for me, I loved the book. My one complaint probably was that I listened to the audiobook, which I should just come to terms with the fact that I can't do audiobooks because I get <laughs> way too distracted. And, you know, she, ta she talks about a lot of factual things and spills out a lot of, I mean, she's a genius. She's so smart and so well-spoken and knows all these facts and figures. So for that, that was a little hard for me to keep track of what she was talking about sometimes, and you know, because I'm listening to it at work and just wasn't paying very good attention, I guess. But um, yeah, this was the first election for me that I really paid a lot of attention to. The f last two elections were while I was in college because I'm a baby. Um, <laughs> and so it, I, they didn't, weren't really that relevant, but this was the first one that was a huge deal to me. And I was so, so upset when she lost. So reading this was just you know, like crying every chapter. So it was cathartic. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like Anne, I didn't know a whole lot about her. 
Um, but I learned it through her campaign. I remember like just even learning about the Children's Defense Fund and her history with like, even just like when she was with them, like going door to door or like going undercover at, at newly private schools that, um, to see whether or not they were following like integration rules and, and realizing that they weren't and getting them, you know, I, I just, I couldn't believe that her entire life had been in public service. And that was something that people weren't aware of, or that I wasn't aware of as a person who knew who she was. Like, I just assumed she was his wife. And, you know, like it just, when I learned all of that on the campaign trail, it just, it changed everything that I believed about her, which was fairly neutral to, to, to not caring. Um, and made me want her to win, not just like a, not just as a, as the, um, opposite of Trump or, or as a former secretary of state or whatever, but really because I believe she cared about people and cared about the nation and cared. And anyway, it just, um, it brought a lot of that home rereading it, but that those were all things that I remember when I first heard about them, when she was campaigning this year, I was like, holy shit, she's incredible. She's more incredible than any other presidential candidate I voted for at any point in time. And this is ridiculous. Like I was so excited, had my daughter on the couch, like ready to watch um, election night. And I remember just, we went to bed. I made her go to bed early. I was like, forget it. We're not watching because it was so sad. And um, so this book kind of like, just kind of reinvigorated how much I care about her and, and how sad this whole situation is. Well, she's so genuine. I mean, that's what is so baffling to me is that so many people that could that should read this book and learn a little bit about her would just say that she's a charlatan or she's pretending. But this woman has done the work. I mean, she was the first student that Wesley and picked a Wellesley picked to 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 give a speech yeah. at their graduation. Like from jump, I mean, she has been you know, ex exceeding and, you know, her faith and her Methodism. And, um, and even as I read it, I was raised Southern Baptist and I thought I might have a whole, whole different perspective if I had been raised Methodist as opposed to Southern Baptist. And, and when I was really, um, I even wrote down when she, um, she wrote, she gave the name of, um, of a sermon that she read that she, that kind of after the campaign, that kind of always brought her comfort and um, it just is frustrating to me that there's a group of people out there who would just say, you know, that's all just bullshit when, you know, what we have in the White House is just an orange blob of bullshit. But Hillary Clinton <laughs> is completely genuine. And she's the, the insights that she gave. Um, I'm going to read it because I feel like this is something that all um, the thing that got me the most when she said, when she was talking about being a mother, and I think it was hard for her to get pregnant. Obviously, she never had another baby, um, and I could really relate to that. And then when she said, I hadn't realized how much I wanted a daughter until she arrived. She was a wish so secret, I didn't even know I had wished it. And it was just like, that is exactly how I felt about my own daughter. And I just these, you know, I can't imagine the president, I mean, Trump even having any kind of emotion like that. And to know where she came from with the story of her mother, I mean, it is just gutting. And that chapter where she talks about how she wished that she could go back in time to her mother on that train as an eight year old to California and just say, I know this seems awful right now, but one day you're going to have a daughter who runs for president. And it was just, it ripped my guts out. And I just, there's such an empathy to her, but just a genuineness that really came across for me in this book. Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely yeah. agree. Um, one of the things on Twitter, Molly said, I wish the Hillary in the book could have been translated more in the campaign trail. And I completely agree. It's like there's this person in the book is was nowhere to be found in the media, nowhere to be found, you know, and I'm not a big news watcher. I'm not like I don't watch political news, you know, any of that, um, you know, but just so I kind of get like, you know, just whatever is blaring is it you know it has to be very obvious for me to see it and so it was just really disappointing i think so many people are like that you know that they just don't get they don't follow politics or things like that very closely and so 
all that you got and she even you know did those little word clouds in her book of like the only thing you associated with her was emails and you know things that were actually really irrelevant and it's like none of this and she she talks about that but like none of these things that were so impressive to me from this book were ever like you had we would have had to go digging to find them and so i think that's just really disappointing that you know that, that and unfair on the part of the media that none of this ever was you know made available to and she rightfully audiences. calls them out because she says media yeah. wanted a steady diet of conflict and scandal and everything is entirely about the horse race almost entirely everything is about the horse race and that's so true yeah and so i just think that's so disappointing because i'm like how many people's minds would have been changed if they you know even just knew a little bit of this you know the people that are one issue voters or whatever if they even had any idea of some of the the really good things that she championed um yeah i mean i think it could have changed things and it's just it's disappointing agreed i so, remember thinking like I remember, I remember thinking there was just like this for me i never understood um her marriage i guess um because i didn't understand marriage really when all of that happened and um i'd never understood how she could have stayed with him and can and like even when i saw him on the trail i'd be like Ugh, ick. like why is he still your husband and so her her discussion about her and bill and like their life together instead of it being something that i felt like she was enduring I felt like it was something to aspire to. And I didn't think that I would ever feel that way about a marriage between two people knowing that, you know, one party had been cheated on repeatedly. And I, I do not think that, I think that there's a big mistake in, in, in like grandfathering Bill Clinton out of sexual assault and, and sexual harassment. And he's done some horrible things. And I think that people tend to act like he didn't because we like Hillary um, or because we liked some things that he did as president or, you know, we just have a short memory. We're supposed to be icons or whatever. But I do think that personally between the two of them being able to continue a marriage and make it be strong and make it be um, something that isn't just something that you endure, but something that you um, fight for and are proud of and is the kind of the strength point of your life is admirable. And I was, I, I admired her in that, in those moments too, and, and just understood it a little bit more. I, um, I was also really proud of her and very happy that she was not afraid to name names. And I like that she kept coming back to james comey over and over again like she was never ever going to let him off the hook yeah. i thought her chapter about um putin in fact i think her chapter about kind of the what the real what happened chapter in terms of the emails and explaining the server i feel like every person that voted should have to read that chapter because mm -hmm. she so succinctly lays it out for us and for any dumb dumb out there to really kind of understand the chronological order what went down um but i just i like her i love that she calls out chris Eliza by name because that guy is the fucking worst oh. I, love, I mean i know katie you like bernie but i love that she says you know bernie is not a democrat and he's yeah. not and that he did not go into this race to be the Democratic nominee, but so much more to disrupt the Democratic Party. Um, she gives him props where props are due, but I think she gives him, oh, hi, gives him um, a bit of, you know, the grief that, that should be coming to him. And of course, she continually reminds us over and over again what Donald Trump is as a sexual predator um and it was just so odd reading it seeing it kind of just ha continue to happen in real time and then as the harvey weinstein stuff comes out mm -hmm. like the reminder that we ha could have had this woman and yet now we have this disgusting human being um in the white house and i just was really proud of her and kind of her fearlessness and and her not being afraid to go there and i also <laughs> love the moment i mean i i George W. Bush, I know that we like to pretend that 
or, or like compared to Trump, he's not so awful. But I mean, I remember the, the Bush years very well thinking he's a warmonger. But, you know, the, the comment that she made about, you know, during the inauguration and Bush, you know, that was some weird shit that went down. Like, I just, her honesty and, and willing to call people out, I just thought it was really refreshing and something you don't usually hear from people in this and I think it's, climate. And, and I think it's also, I mean, it's like it's really important to, like, remember, like, these, these are incredibly powerful people, too. Like, it's not just like, calling you're out like up. you're not she's not punching down exactly 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 and it's like it's not you know it's not common for anyone of any gender to be able to do that and we can see that with the incredible cowardice that is just infecting our entire congress right now that this is not this is not a thing that people in our government do and and i i agree like i love like there's something about the balance of her being like really genuine about the, she felt like she didn't do a good job, which was actually like incredibly heartbreaking as a woman, like listen to her, like doubt her moves over and over and over again. And again, knowing that this like buffoon who has never had one second of self-reflection in his entire life is currently in the office of the, of the president. But like that kind of counterbalance the fact that she's like, you know, she's not afraid to come out swinging. And, I, and you know, you would mention the empathy thing that she's talking about, you know, toward the end of the book. And there's that one line where she's, she says, well, why does it have to be us who's always having to have the empathy? Like, where is the halfway when she's talking about, like, yes, the white working class is hurting, but what about the African Americans in this country who have had, like, 300 years of, of being denied? Like, where, where is the empathy for them? Like, why is it always... It's so one-sided and I just like I really kind of appreciated that kind of balance if you're back and forth throughout throughout the book yeah my favorite call outs were about Comey and obviously like Putin and and all of that but like when she was doing this back and forth kind of mirroring between what Comey had done wrong like what other um, FBI directors former FBI directors or Department of Justice officials or even like some of his deputies were saying this is not okay. This is not what he should have done. And she was um, bolstering that or, or making her point with Rosenstein's letter. Like she was using Rosenstein's <laughs> letter to show what Comey had done wrong as well, like using it as, a, as, as evidence. And I was like, how like smart are you? Like how smart are you to take the opposition's stupidity? Like... <laughs> this stupid excuse that they come up with and yet use it as the proof that you need right. to show that this was the wrong thing to do. And I just felt like it was such a beautiful moment because yes, there are conservatives and Republicans who think that um, Rosenstein like was, was wrong and he was working for, for the Democrats to, to do this, you know, against Trump and to make him look like a fool or whatever. But the truth is he was Trump's guy and he wrote this thing and he said that Comey didn't do things well. And she has every right to use that official document as mm -hmm. proof that Comey didn't do the right thing. And I just was, I, I just thought she's so, she's just wily and smart. And <laughs> um, I like that part a lot. One of my favorite yeah, quotes was, was oh, oh, something about how, um, how it's ridiculous how she, a human, needed to be humanized at all. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's just so, <laughs> it makes me so angry because it's so true, you know. She doesn't have to prove herself as anything that she's not. She can be a bitch. She can be tough. She tells it like it is. And I think, you know, she's so genuine, as we said, whereas Trump has never said a genuine thing in his life. So the comparison, reading it while having him as current president, seeing all these headlines was just, infuriating and reading the chapter on Putin and Russia I'm now terrified more than I <laughs> was before because I didn't know any of that stuff um, so that was um, really eye-opening uh, every chapter there was something that you're just like oh my god things are even worse than I thought they were and you could have done such a better job and it's so depressing that because people didn't think you were genuine or because you're a woman all these stereotypes that got put on her head her shoulders are the reason why she didn't win and I don't know if that I know we said before maybe if people had read this it would have changed how they voted but honestly I don't know if it, it would have mm -hmm. I don't know if it was just you know they're gonna 
say she's lying no matter what she says, which is really sad. So I don't know. I come down on Comey. I still think that. Yeah. Well, that too. Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, I, there's obviously there's a lot of factors, but she would have hundred percent won had he not done what he did yeah. in July. And then again in October. I think it's a combination of Comey and voter suppression on the state level, especially when you consider like Wisconsin, the state that she lost in Michigan. I just think that that those two pieces together, and that's why I'm happy that Obama has decided that like the one issue that he really wants to focus on the most is is voter suppression because it's really it's real and it has an impact. But yeah, Comey, racism, and voter suppression. I wonder how voter, I, we don't have that problem. I, and we might have that problem here, but I'm going to be honest. I have been to the wrong polling place several times as an adult without a voter registration card and have had the, you know, they're just like, no, you're supposed to go here. And then when I go there, I don't have my voter registration card, but I can vote. Like, I, I mean, is it just about IDs? Like you have to have a, well, some of them it's about IDs um, it, and it's a kind of like its own type of polling tax because it costs money to get an ID. Um, in certain states, there's only so many DMVs that are even available for people mm -hmm. to get to to get um, an, a voter ID. There are some states that say if you have any um, outstanding fines um, or tickets that you can't get you know, you can't get your voter, you can't get your ID, you can't get your driver's license. So it's kind of like there are these they put these encumbrances on people that shouldn't be there. There should be, I shouldn't have to have a driver's license or a voter ID. I shouldn't have to make an extra step to vote. I'm guaranteed it in the constitution. It's these, these things to fix voter fraud. They're fixing a problem that doesn't exist. And they're just meant to put roadblocks in front of people, especially poor people, brown people, and keeping them from being able to have the right to vote. I remember she tells a story um, in it about a woman who had lost her ID. Um, and so she went with her social security card and her insurance card and like something else, like uh, another, a different kind of photo ID. Um, and they still didn't let her vote. And I yeah. was like, if, if I had my water bill that has my name on it and has my address on it and then like my social security card, they'd be like, okay. And that's, I mean, I, I just, I don't get some of the rules, I guess. That's I'm like, what is that going on? Because, I mean, that's that's why, a little plug for state races, it's different every state. There's no federal mm -hmm. standard. And, you know, so they can do, you know, a certain par party gets in charge and they do whatever they can to suppress, you know, the, the other party. And that's, you know, you know, some of the things that have happened in the past with things like ID is that, you know, if they they send out, you know, voter registration materials with, you know, really strongly worded threats, you know, warnings about people showing up and like dire consequences, you know, if you have, you know, they'll, they'll say things like, you know, if you have like a, you know, if you were arrested or like they, you know, they're just like, they put out this misinformation that makes people who may have been through our criminal justice system feel like they are exposing themselves by showing up at polling places. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's a huge mix of things and because it's so different from state to state and it's set by, you know, the secretary of state of each one, um, you know, you know, Chris Kobach being the, the poster child for <laughs> the worst of the worst, who is now leading up the voter suppression thing. But, um, and yeah, with the information just, what is he from? Interesting, the data breaches that have been out there with the Equifax yeah. Experian, whatever, which one it is, people, because he's requesting social security numbers, you know, all of this identifying information that again makes people fearful well mm -hmm. if you're going to need my social security number for me to register to vote i don't want to register to vote because my data yeah. could somehow be breached but yeah, yeah. what Could state be. is he from he's kansas right i don't know i, was I think he's kansas <laughs> yeah I think so so my favorite quote from the book um actually wasn't it was hillary quoting someone else and it was bill's Uncle Buddy, and when he said, and I want to cross stitch this, anybody who makes you, who's, who tries to make you mad and stops you from thinking, like be aware, be aware of anybody who tries to make you mad and stops you from thinking. There's a lot to be said for thinking. <laughs> and I just thought that is exactly what happened in this election. Trump got a bunch of people mad.
you know, Mexicans are rapists. Black people are coming to take away your benefits. You know, your health care costs are going to go up because this guy over here is on Obamacare. And so he really uh, tapped into anger and that keeps people from thinking. And then this gets back Beth, to what you said, you know, in the end, Comey is is the um, is the problem in the end, because Hillary even said people use Comey in the end as a reason not to vote for her. Mm-hmm. Not to not vote for Trump, but to just say, I've I've all I've been on the fence, I've been looking for a reason not to vote for Hillary. Yeah. Now he gave it to me. And I think that's I mean, there's a saying, um, one of my favorite liberal websites, the stupid, it burns. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of stupid people who do have the right to vote that don't think and that will tap into their anger and their hatred. And I do like that she wants to have empathy for those people but she does say there are some people some of the deplorables they're just going to always be deplorable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i really saw that i was um i volunteered you know for throughout the fall at her headquarters here but i was there the weekend after that comey letter dropped and i was doing you know texting and um calling to to swing states and that you know it just came back over and over again like uh, how can i vote for someone who's going to jail like, how can I, like, she's going to jail. Like, why, how can I vote for her? And it's just like, oh, the stupid, it burns. It did. Yeah. It burned. It burned. How can you vote for a sexual predator? It's like, know, it's, which is worse? Exactly. Well, as the mother of a daughter. <laughs> oh, gosh. Now, there's a, a political <laughs> podcast that I listen to, and the guy um, says that people are, what, what Trump taps into is your lizard brain. Like just that (laughs) reactionary part of Uh your body that you don't really understand why you feel that way. Yeah. Just the animal part of your, you know, you're just your lizard brain. And that's what Trump did so effectively, but at the same time, so, so stupidly, like it just, it took nothing for that, for that part of people's psyche to just like, you know, start dinging and being like, Uh yeah, I recognize that. Oh, he's talking about it more. I recognize myself even more. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I want to say. And I don't think that they even realized that they were pushing away all of their common sense and they were pushing away all of the ethics that they cared about and that they said that they cared about. And they're pushing away all of the protocols and all of the precedent and all the things that you would, you know, just the fact that you don't want Trump in the Hall of Presidents at Disney World. It's like all of a sudden nobody was thinking about that shit. And that's like things that you normally think about during a presidential election, right? And I just was, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, lizard brain. Well, I think she hit the nail on the head when she said that um, keep that she compared it to like when you're in an argument with your spouse or when you're frustrated about something and your spouse wants to like fix your problems and you're like, I don't want you to fix my problems. I just want you to like listen. And she's like, that's what Trump did. He just said, I'm angry too. And she's like, she was trying to fix the problems yeah. when people weren't ready to have their problems fixed. They just wanted someone to say, I'm angry too. And it's like, gosh, like that's so, you know. And it's so frustrating because the more I read, I was like, oh, my gosh, she had so many good ideas. This could have been so much better. And, you know, things I never even heard about, like, because, you know, again, because all I heard from the media was emails, emails, scandal. She's dishonest. You know, like there's kind of like people think when there's smoke, there's fire. And so because they kept Mm -hmm. people kept putting smoke out there, everyone assumed there must be fire when there wasn't. And so. Yeah. And so it's like we never got to hear. We've never even got to hear her solutions, but you know, she didn't, she didn't do what Donald Trump did. And was just like, yeah, I'm angry too. And let's go blame everybody else. Um, the other good point I thought she had was that people think that life is like a zero sum game. And so that if someone else is doing better then I, I have to be doing worse. And so, you know, so, guys, I'm so great for me. It's because someone else is doing better. And, you know, she's like, I want to bring all of us up. And, you know, Donald Trump, unfortunately, was like, oh, hey, let's I, I'm going to speak to specific people and tell you I'll bring you up. And but we got to bring other people down. And, you know, people wanted to hear that. And it's unfortunate because I agree with her that life isn't a zero sum game. But I guess not everyone feels that way. So. Yeah. How many times did you guys like cry? I cried a lot. <laughs> I cried. I don't know if it was because of the book or because I was dealing with a breakup. <laughs> I got to the 
I actually used it as um, a way to kind of boost my spirits in the morning because I would get up and I would make a pot of coffee. I fled, I flew through like the first 150 pages and then I realized like I wanted to kind of savor it a little bit more. So I created this morning routine where I would get up early, I would make a pot of coffee, I would make myself some avocado toast <laughs> and I would just sit down and, and read it until I had to start getting Ruby ready for school. And so um, I think the part that I cried at the most was, um, was about her mom. And as I, I'm not saying as a mother, the worst part for me about motherhood now is that anytime a child is in danger, I immediately think of my own child being in that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it's makes it so much more personal than it ever was before I had kids. And this is not a knock on anybody. Um, who doesn't have children, but um, I just, it, it makes it like I picture Ruby on that train going to California and being in that kind of situation. And I just, the endurance of her mother and the fact that this woman could see, didn't let that, that horrible thing that happened to her break her. And she knew that there was love out there. And then that she showed that love to her child and she raised this woman, Hillary Rodham Clinton, to be this empathetic, lovely person, I just think it's such a, a testament to the human spirit. Um, but I do like about her mom that when Hillary called and said, I don't like it here at Wellesley, I want to come home. And her dad was like, because he always came across as like the tough guy a little bit. He was like, okay, come home. But then her mom was like, no, there are no quitters in this family. And so it was like she gave her the push that she wanted. So yeah, that's all the stories about her mom or just or Hillary being a mom, those are the things that touched me the most and made me cry. I think when she was talking about, um, she was agonizing over the tone of her victory speech. <laughs> like that destroyed me that absolutely I could like I could barely make it through that because here she is like, literally like, how do I reach out to these people who didn't vote for me, who have this incredibly different worldview and, and unify them and, and reassure them that I will be present for everybody. And I just was like, I was, I was a fucking mess. Like that just slaughtered me because it was like, yet again, like that, you know, what's going to happen. You know, what's going to happen. You ever you know fool yourself? Did you ever fool yourself at all reading it? Almost like a novel of like thinking like, <laughs> My win, and like fooling yourself that she is going to get to make that speech, and then like the reality of it would hit me of like, no, you know what happened. It does make you wish that you could just that that there has to be some retroactive way to make it right again, and um, so I I would. I would cry when it was when she was talking about somebody on the trail, like a young girl on the trail who like came up and said something to her. Those things would like to, because she's so tender with people. And, mm -hmm. um, and when you think about stupid Trump and you're just, you're just like, there's no way that he can relate to people in a tender way. And throwing um, paper towels at people in a disaster <laughs> area. I just don't think that he has it in him, even if they were rich and, and, you know, Manhattanite, but I still don't think that he's yeah. capable of of being empathetic and, and 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 reaching out to them in a way that's not creepy as hell. Like I just don't think that that's real for him. And so it would just make me just so dejected. And when I remember like watching the election night with my daughter and just her being disappointed and 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 just anytime she was talking about election night, like when she was just really discussing election night, I was like a mess. I was just like that was the worst night mm -hmm. ever. Like I slept fitfully and woke up like. I was sick to my stomach. Like it was just awful. And, you know, I just remember being like, I can't believe that this is happening. And then when reading it again, I just, it just felt so surreal and, and, and devastating all over again. It was rough. Mm. Yeah. I think knowing the outcome while reading about all these really joyful moments that she had when she was at, you know, the DNC and the image of her over the glass ceiling and all these incredible moments. And then you remember Oh, that's it. It didn't work out that way in the end, and those were the moments that made me tear up. I never really cried because I read it, well, listened to it while I was at work, so you know, <laughs> had to compose myself. But there were so many moments like that where you 
all these good things that she could have done or all these amazing moments that they had on the trail. And, you know, you think they're leading to something and then remembering that, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that outcome was the part how that was really it, got how to was me. it listening to it? What is, what is she like as a narrator? It's, you know, I think, I think Heidi said something like this on one of the posts on the group. She is a little monotone. You know, you get why people feel like she's being dishonest because she doesn't speak with a lot of emotion, even though the things she's saying are really filled with emotion. So I can get where that would turn people off. And I think that's why there are parts that I tuned out on because, you know, she's, it, I guess it's soothing in a sense. But um, yeah, I, I think I would have enjoyed it more reading it because I could have, you know, put my own tone into it. I'm glad she read it. It would have been weird if somebody else did, but yeah, <laughs> I did it's both. Trump I, reading it. <laughs> I, I read it and I listened to it. I did both. And, what did you um, think? Uh, my problem with it was I was listening to it uh, at like one and a half speed because oh, I yeah. felt like she was too slow and that made yeah. it very robotic. Mm-hmm. Um, the one and a half speed, you know, just kind of and um, but I, uh, I enjoyed listening to her at, at different moments, but I felt like she was more humorous and more, mm-hmm. um, uh, more relatable on the page than, yeah. but I, uh, I, it's not a bad audiobook. I've listened to a lot of them and it's, it's listenable for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the, the, just the facts and figures later on were, were what wasn't. And like when she gets mad, that's fun to listen to. Like she, when she's kind of letting Bernie have it, I was like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> burn him. Burn him. It was great. So she gets a little testy and you can kind of hear it. And that's um that's kind of satisfying. So I, I does she, does she read the um the quotes before each chapter? Like does she yes. say that which does not kill us, make us stronger? Friedrich Nietzsche and <laughs> Kelly Clarkson. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Every that was word. the perfect opening because it just was like this is gonna be serious and it's also gonna be fun. Yeah, it, when it was, it was serious and it was fun. Like my pen, Wizards with Her. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. Aww. So it's 10.06. Any last words about what happened, guys? Loved it. What a weird boozy book club that was. Like <laughs> political novel that just ripped our hearts out and the YA filler that we were like, meh. <laughs> But I loved it. So let's give what happened thumbs up or thumbs down so we can do officials business right in front of your face so we can see it. That Should is five reading. wine bottles, guys. That's fi- that's a good book. Five Chardonnay. <laughs> yes. Five bottles of Chardonnay with Hillary. And she likes that's a good that. martini, she says. Mm. I love that she likes food. and she- Yeah. Oh, she mentioned Chipotle. Yeah. <laughs> that's and my girl. Thai food. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. The pork chop on a stick, man. <laughs> right, because it was good. It was good. I didn't eat it because it was politically necessary. I yeah. ate the pork chop on a stick because it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's how I felt about funnel cake and my rotel dip. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Do you think Hillary has ever had um, rotel? Yes. She was the first lady of Arkansas. Yeah. She's had Rotel and she's yeah. probably had the poncho stip I was telling you about earlier. All right. Guaranteed. <laughs> um, <laughs> Arkansas is right by Memphis, by the way, in case you didn't know. It's just across the bridge. Those middle states all kind of blend together for me. Um, Arkansas is <laughs> the first city right across the bridge from Memphis in Arkansas is called West Memphis. Oh, that's like Thank Kansas you. City. It's not really in Kansas. Or the East St. Louis. Which yeah. is not really in Missouri. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you for joining us for Boozy Book Club, those of you that joined us online. Not as many of you are here for, as for Hang Outlanders. That's disappointing, you guys. Yes. You can read other books besides Outlander and <laughs> come and talk about them, especially this one. It was really good. Um, but if you are hearing this for the first time on the podcast or you listened all the way through or you're watching us on YouTube, go to Facebook, Facebook slash groups slash Tea and Book Club. Join us there. Um, within the next week, we'll have a new poll up for our next book. And I know some of you said that we wanted to do polls a little or pick books a little bit earlier so you could try to get them from the library. We are going to try to do that. We're only going to have one more book, uh, between November and December because it'll be the holidays. So like 
not one book, but two books. So one more boozy book club for, for 2017. And so you should have enough time to probably get it and, and listen to it before we, um, have a, have the hangout for it. So, um, hopefully, um, but we're going to have a poll up soon. So, but only if you're part of the club, do you get to vote in the poll? So join the club on Facebook as a group. Um, thank you for joining us. And we love you guys. Amy, thank you for moderating the what happened part of this talk. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Katie. And we will see you guys next time. Next week is Hang Outlander on the A Malcolm episode. So if you're still watching Outlander season three, Ooh. next week's a big deal. See you then, guys. Bye. <laughs>